My name is Chris Hodge. I'm an advisor at the IOD Centre of Corporate Governance, which was set up last year to provide thought leadership across a wide area, range of areas related to, to governance and across a wide range of sectors, including many that the IOD perhaps traditionally is not focused on. And that's very much where today's webinar comes in. We're looking at the important topic of governance in universities. Um, I will hand over to our moderator today, Professor Andrew Kakabadze from the Henley Business School, who is uh, might be better qualified to explain to you both the issue and what the discussion is that we'll be having today. Andrew, in turn, will introduce our very distinguished panel. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Chris. Good morning, everybody. I'm Andrew Kakabadze, moderator for this session. The session is critical because it examines the nature of governance in universities, uh, perhaps too much or the lack of it, and what we need to do to improve our uh, university institutions so that we can face the future better. We have a very distinguished panel, as Chris has said. We have Sir Michael Barber. Sir Michael, a politician, head of Tony Blair's delivery unit, the very first person to hold the chair of the Office of Students and in many ways, the regulator of universities. Um, he's currently chairman and founder of Delivery Associates. Apart from his many distinguishing features, Michael is a publisher of two Penguin books. Most people are lucky if they get one Penguin book published, but he has two. Our second member of the panel is Sir Steve Smith, political scientist, very distinguished career. Uh, until recently, the vice chancellor of Exeter University, and in many ways, in my opinion, has made Exeter a case example of the outstanding governance that universities can achieve. Uh, now he is looking at international partnerships on behalf of government, and in many ways this is a first uh, position for him as well. Jerry Brown, our third panellist. Jerry, a long distinguished career in business and public service. He is chairman of Novaquiz Capital. He has been chair of quite a number of organisations. He has been CEO. He has also been non-executive director of a number of organisations. He is independent council member at Exeter University, visiting fellow at Henley Business School, and equally an author of two books and now writing a third with a colleague at London Business School. Welcome, dear panel members. What I would like to do is ask our panel members to make their comments, which will be up to 10 minutes, in the following order. So Michael Barber first, representing regulator. So Steve uh, Smith second, as if you like the chief executive, vice chancellor of universities, and Jerry Brown, third, is the independent council member looking into universities and trying to make comments uh, which would lead to improvement. Michael, if we can start with you, the question is very simple. From your experience, what would you say is needed to enhance the governance of universities, if that's the key question, so that universities can face the future far better than they face it up to now? Thank you, Andrew, and thanks for the opportunity to be with you all. I really appreciate it. It's, it's a very important topic, as, as Andrew said in the introduction, and I'm glad the IOD and Chris are, are really getting into governance because it's so important, not just in the university and higher education sector, but more generally. I was, um, as uh, Andrew said, I was chair of the, the first chair of the Office for Students, the, the, the founding chair. I uh, finished my term at the end of March. I learned a lot. It was an enormous pleasure to work even in very, very difficult circumstances with the universities of this country. They're full of fantastic people, fantastic students doing wonderful things. And to me, the, um, the governance task, whether you look at it for the, for the country or for each individual institution is two things. First of all, you need, we have, and we're very fortunate to have this, and Steve knows this from his, his day-to-day -day work around the world with other countries. We have a world-class higher education sector in research, in teaching, in the standards of our degrees, the, the value that our degrees hold around the world and in this country, and in the effect of our universities on regional and local economies. So the whole diverse sector that we call the higher education sector is an enormous asset for the United Kingdom, uh, and, um, uh, and in the case of the Office for Students for England in particular. And the first object of governance is to maintain and develop that world-class sector so that it remains exceptional, remains world-leading uh, and continues to make a vast contribution to British society, culture and the economy. That's the task one. The second is um, the, the, um, 
we have to make sure that our universities are contributing to local, regional and national economic growth. Uh, the Prime Minister currently talks a lot about levelling up. Universities are absolutely fundamental to that. Um, and universities need to think hard about how they do that, how they work with regional partners, employers, uh, other parts of the education system and so on. And they need to make sure that people who don't necessarily ever set foot on a university campus or in a university building understand how valuable universities are to the local, regional and national and indeed sometimes international economy. So governance is fundamental for those two big reasons. And the, we have to do that in a time when globally higher education is becoming more and more competitive. You look at the growth of the Chinese university sector over the last 20 years, it's breathtaking. Uh, you look at some of the competition in places you might not expect, like in Pakistan uh, or, or India, uh, parts of Africa, parts of Latin America. I visited universities in all these places. You see the growth of institutions that can revolutionize the way we think about universities and make a, a big difference. So we have to be aware of the global competition and anybody governing the system, whether at national level or institutional level, needs to be aware of that context and thinking not just about the day-to-day -day decisions that come before the governing council, but thinking in stewardship terms. How do I make sure this institution is better prepared five years, 10 years, 15 years uh, from now for the future? I think there are five challenges facing the university sector at the moment. There are obviously many, but I want to mention five, all of them important. All of them will affect every institution. And if you're involved in governance, either as an executive or a non-executive person on a governing council, all of these things will come before you and all need serious thought. First of all, the financial context is going to be very tough for universities in the next three or four years. We've just had a spending review. It was a very generous spending review to the public sector, but the university sector uh, didn't uh, and wasn't expected to do particularly well because the university sector had a good austerity decade where it was well-funded compared to the rest of the public sector. Uh, but now the, the, the chickens are coming home to roost. It will be more challenging. Uh, you can expect the, the unit of resource, the cost per student to reduce by somewhere between 10 and 15% over a three to four year period. Uh, there are decisions still waiting to be made in government that might make that tighter still. Uh, so that's the first thing. So good stewardship of the finances is fundamentally important. And the governing council members individually and collectively need to make sure they're on top of that and that the executive team is sharing information that enables good decision-making, short, medium, and long-term, that stewardship point I made. Second, one of the things the pandemic brought about, as everybody now knows, is a big rapid shift into digital teaching and learning. Uh, there's not gonna be a moment where we shift from face-to-face -face teaching to digital teaching, learning, and teaching and learning, but we are in a phase where combining those in different mixes is gonna be fundamental to every single university. What is the right combination mm -hmm for a particular course, a particular university, a particular group of students, right combination of digital face-to-face -face and everything in between. Blended is the jargon for it. Um, and that has in, in, huge implications for the way universities organize themselves and in what they invest in. If I just take one example on capital programs, universities have been through a, a 20 year period of building buildings, uh, student accommodation, learning, study spaces, libraries, fantastic. It's wonderful when you look around. Lots of them have capital programs part way through an implementation that were halted or delayed by the pandemic. People need to think hard and governing councils can help with this about the combination when you're investing in capital, the combination of bricks and mortar and digital capacity. And normally speaking in the past, it would have been kind of 90% hard building you know bricks and mortar and 10 percent digital capacity it now needs to move to something more like 50 50 um, these are not research findings i'm just giving you a scale uh, an order of merit to think about so thinking through how you invest in digital capacity which will affect research as well as teaching as well as international partnerships is really important third academic appointments and staff development um Governing council members generally won't be involved in those appointments, although that crucially the appointment of vice chancellors is, is a fundamental task for, for them. But the but academic, setting the rules for academic appointments, ensuring diversity of academic appointments, ensuring you don't get groupthink in an economics department or a 
uh, political science department, that you get diverse perspectives is fundamental. Um, and investing in staff development so that long-standing academic staff can adapt their teaching, learning, and sometimes their research techniques to the new digital age. Uh, that's a challenge uh, and it's gonna be really important. Fourth challenge, we have a regulator now, the Office for Students. We, I, I loved setting it up. It was very challenging, it was very complicated. And one thing we're still learning about as a sector is what is the right relationship between the regulator and the institutions, the regulator and the regulated. Um, most of the time it should be all right because the regulator sets its standards. Uh, the universities know what those are. In the first phase, of course, we were all learning what that actually looked like in practice. Most universities adapted well to that. But then there's a question about how you, if you're a regulator, how you intervene and um, on what grounds you intervene. And we spent some of the early years beginning to think about that and in, in some uh, handful of cases, actually acting on it. That will become a bigger uh, challenge for the Office for Students and for institutions in the future as they come under financial pressure uh, and they, the, the quality of some of the degree, program, degree, degree programs they're offering gets questioned. The regulator of the Office for Students has the capacity and the, the, has the powers to intervene in, in institutions or in individual courses and programs in institutions and may choose to do that in the future. What would that look like? When I was chairman, we, had, we intervened in some cases where there was financial fragility or in a couple of cases where there was egregious uh, behavior, uh, corrupt, to put it, put it bluntly, you can choose when you're the chair of a regulator how you intervene. Now, we had powers to, for example, to summon all the emails between a governing council and a chief executive, a, a vice chancellor. Um, we never actually exercised that power, but in one case, we threatened it, and that threat was enough to bring the change that we wanted. Uh, you have to. You have a choice to make about how, what, what you demand in an intervention. Do you need a, a new chair of a governing council? Do you need a new vice chancellor? Do you need both? Uh, do you need something else above and beyond that? Uh, so you have a choice about that. And then the other thing you have a choice about is how public to make all that. There are a couple of cases which we could have quite easily put on the front page of every newspaper and had a story running for um, maybe five, ten days uh, about some. Uh, egregious behavior. We chose not to do that uh, because we could get the change we wanted without doing that. And if we had done that, it would have tarred the entire sector with the brush of a couple of individual cases. We didn't want to do that because going back to my point at the beginning, we think we've got a world-class sector and the question is uh, how you develop that, how you steward it into the future. And then the last um, thing I'll, I'll talk about is protecting and promoting free speech. Um, this is a job for the governing council. A governing council has to stand by the values of the institution and the values of the institution will be spelled out somewhere. And one of those values in a British university has to be academic defense and promotion of academic freedom and uh, free speech. We've seen the case recently in Sussex of uh, a distinguished professor of philosophy hounded out. She resigned in the end, she was, so she wasn't fired and she was uh, defended by the vice chancellor but is that really acceptable i don't know enough about it but in those situations the governing council and the chair of the governing council can play a crucial role in defense of the individual academic academic freedom and freedom of speech and what you can be sure about is if universities themselves and their governing councils don't do that there will be intervention from somewhere outside the sector and that won't necessarily help the sector develop and improve into the future. So these are some, so, so my points are, remember the financial context, prepare for digital capacity, develop your academic staff and make academic appointments that are diverse. Uh, think through the right relationship between the regulator and institutions and protect and promote free speech on every occasion when you need, when you need to. Michael, thank you very much, very clear. Just for the purpose of clarity, you use the word stewardship. Many people use it, but I'm not sure they have a common understanding. What is your understanding of the word stewardship? So I, I, I the, the, if you, if, if anybody wants to follow up, I used stewardship um, in 
the last chapter of my recent book that you, you mentioned, my two Penguin books, the one published this year is called Accomplishment. I look at public value and how you de define public value in there. And it applies to universities or police forces or health service uh, you know, hospitals, institutions. There are four parts of public value. One is, are you delivering the outcomes for which the money was allocated? So if the, if the NHS get lots of money to, to do routine operations, are they actually doing that? And can you measure it and can you see progress? Are they spending the money for what it was intended and are they spending it fairly? There's the second pillar. So first pillar is, are you delivering the outcomes? Second pillar is, are you, uh, are you looking after the money properly and spending it fairly and, and equitably? The third pillar is, are you engaging the people who are involved with? So if you're a university governing council, what is the relationship between the, the institutional governance and the academic staff? What is the relationship between the institutional governance and the students? What is the relationship between them and the whole community in which the, student, the, the university is embedded? And then finally, there's stewardship. Are you making decisions on the three things I've mentioned that take care of the long-term future? Or are you hollowing out the future in order to deliver the present? So stewardship is about constantly thinking ahead, thinking strategically, and making investments in the long-term future. And academic appointments are a classic. If you, if you appoint a brilliant young professor and she has a 25, 30 year career in your institution, that's stewardship. Michael, thank you very much. Can I now turn to Steve Smith? Steve, we've heard the perspective from someone who held a regulator position. You as executive and vice chancellor of a university with many years experience, What's your response to universities, governance, their future, what needs to be done, and within that also their leadership? <clears throat> Thanks, Andrew, and, and, and very happy to, uh, to answer that. And thank you very much indeed for, for the invitation. Um, so I've got five points I'm going to make. Um, and I suppose if there's a text for today's sermon, is that every major failure in a university is ultimately a failure of governance. And it seems to me that, that although clearly management of the people that run an institution um, governance lies absolutely at the heart of institutional performance um, and I'm speaking really on the basis of just having been in the sector you know I started being a vice chancellor in 2002 did 18 years um, and saw quite a lot so here's five points I think that that, that are in response to uh, what you asked Andrew and also in many of them overlap with what Michael said First point is about pace of change. And I do think this is not trivial. Um, everyone always says, oh, we're living in complex times. You know, everyone on this call can say, oh, it's, you know, I could remember other periods when there's been massive pace of change. But I do think the Venn diagram of pressures is actually um, quite specific at the moment. And certainly greater than any time in my experience in the last 20 years. Just let me mention, won't talk about any of them, but let me mention 11 things that if you're a vice chancellor are on your plate this morning. Brexit, how to reorganize uh, student flows, research, um, staffing, supplies, post-Brexit. Two, the pandemic, Michael covered a bit of it, but that just extraordinary effect that we're still not through, massive, you know, fantastic work by professional staff, academic staff to keep things going. Universities never closed, but what a challenge it was. And getting back to normal isn't going to be the old normal. It's going to be a new normal. And I think that's a massive challenge. Third, um, the change of pedagogy that that, that, that represented. Um, what's the right proportion? As Michael said, is it 50-50 investment? But crucially, pedagogy is changing. Although interestingly, Andrew, in all my contacts around the world, pedagogy might be changing, but students really value face-to-face. -face. And I think that's a, you know, there was a kind of enthusiasm at the start that it would all be, you know, move to, to Zoom or Teams, but actually face-to-face. -face, and how do you do that in, in a post-pandemic um, world? Uh, Strikes is my fourth one, you know, very much in the news over the weekend. We could well be um, on strike, having uh, strike action in institutions in the autumn and in the spring. Everyone will have their own views on it. But goodness, that's a hell of a challenge for staff, for those on strike, for those who are not on strike, but also for the leadership of university. 
And it raises a fundamental issue about governance. I think it seems to me every university will be having uh, those discussions. Um, mental health. It's risen throughout the last decade as an issue. When I was VC at Exeter um, with the support of the governors, we, you know, three years running, we doubled our mental health spend um, on providing support. But it's rising as an issue. And one comment, if I may be allowed a personal comment, nothing affects you. Nothing that happens in a university affects you more than if there's a very, very serious personal tragedy around mental health. You feel enormously responsible as a, as a chief exec. Uh, sixth point, I think, international co uh, competition. And my goodness, Michael started this, but I could, this is my kind of special subject on Mastermind. Just look what um, people are investing externally. Um, you know, look at the amount of money that's going in for our competitors. Um, after all, the public finances in the UK don't look great and our competitors are pushing ahead, especially um, in East Asia and South Asia. Um, Seventh, transgender, um, which has caused a lot of noise. Michael referred to the Sussex example, but it's actually an incredibly difficult issue on a campus. Of all the issues I dealt with, I think I found it the one in which there was no resting place where you could get kind of um, uh, some kind of settlement, some kind of uh, peace. Um, then funding. Um, lots I could say on it. Michael you know, painted actually quite a rosy picture in an odd way, only a 10 to 15 percent uh, reduction. Um, if you read some of the press stories, um, what is coming through is a desire to save public funding. Could talk about this a lot, but the, bulk, the, 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 the growth of student numbers, the growth in participation, participation rates going up one to two percent a year, plus the rise in the population uh, of 18 year olds uh, and that need to do much more for FE, real pressures there. Um, Horizon, I just want to say Horizon, um, this is the, the European funding scheme for research. The obvious point in Horizon is we still don't know. It's got caught up in EU politics. Talk at the weekend of government running a UK system for the two billion a year they're putting in. It's not the money particularly, and you do have to thank government for that, that commitment on research. But how do you realise this? What are the structures for research in that world? Um, then two final ones, really. Uh, Free, free speech, M Michelle Donlan's comments last week about, about a free speech bill. Um, that issue I think is going to be front and center. And then finally, press interest. Press are interested in everything governments, uh, the universities do, and governors will be really interested in all of that. So that's the first point. I'll run through the others very quickly. Secondly, the complexity of the business. I do think this is not insignificant. I mean, it's a weird business, Andrew. Um, you lose money in large areas of research. You lose money in teaching most science and medicine subjects. Um, you may be break even on uh, UK students doing humanities and social sciences, although increasingly with inflation ripping away and fees at best uh, li cash limited uh, for UK students, that's going to come under pressure. International students make money in terms of tr allowing you to fund the research base. But it's an odd model where so much of your, it's really important point actually for governors, and I'm sure many governors on the call will realize that when they started working at universities, it's an odd business when two of your three major funding streams actually lose money. And I think that makes it a complex business. The research, the teaching, and the innovation, place-based, widening participation kind of issues pull people all over the place and governors will rightly prioritize those in very different ways and comes back to the long term actually you know long term do you sacrifice the research base in order to balance the books um so in those issues of complexity some big questions third point and i think really probably for governance the biggest challenge and that's the divergence of the sector the sector is now moving in incredibly different directions People writing the history of, the set of this period will say 2012, well, we know what happened then, fees tripled. But actually, it wasn't the tripling of fees that altered things. It was the freeing up of student numbers so that students could move to an institution they wanted to go to rather than have uh, make a decision to go to an institution where there were places. And if you look at some of the changes um, uh, in the sector uh, on student numbers, both up and down, 
Both of them give governance challenges. Both of them, you know, uh, obviously if you lose 20, 30, 40, 50% of your student numbers, which some institutions have, or if you gain 50% of your, uh, on your student numbers, that can cause you issues. And there's a really deep governance question there about what's the right thing to do and what's the right balance uh, to get. And I think the divergence of the sector is probably the number one challenge because it assumes, or there is an assumption that everyone will see it in the same way. And we may want to come back to this, Andrew, in questions, but it goes back to you, the, 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 Jerry and your recent book. Um, a lot of governors didn't seem to be aware of what the divergence meant. It's as if they saw the sector in a straightforward way. And if you have different views, then I think there's a governance issue. Fourth point, stakeholder complexity. The point here is it's really a builds on that third point. Um, you've got alumni, you've got students, you've got staff, you've got governors, you've got uh, casualized staff who, who wanted to get on the academic ladder. You've got staff that have been there many years. Um, you've got your local community. You know, universities are anchor institutions in the cities and towns in which they exist. People are gonna want very different things from the uni. You know, there's a very strong view regionally that universities have the deepest pockets. And, you know, does that mean um, then that they can fund things? You know, an expectation that out of civic duty, you will support the local theatre. You will uh, support the Commonwealth Games bid. You will uh, support this, that and the other. And I think that stakeholder complexity is really difficult precisely because uh, in a diverging sector, with those 11 pressures I mentioned, those different stakeholders will see those pressures differently. And I think for the chair of governors and for the governing body, sorting those out, I think is, is really quite complex. And my final comment, and again, it comes out that, back to that outstanding empirical research, Andrew, that you and Jerry uncovered in your recent book. It's the time available for governors to govern. It's interesting finding that governors uh, in the university sector seem to spend uh, less time um, on governance than in many comparable sectors. And, uh, and on the one hand, the danger is if they spend so much time, they then cross into management. On the other hand, I think you, the empirical evidence in your book showed that this is not a sector where there's a lot of time spent on governance. Um, now, uh, that's assuming the empirical evidence is correct. I know when I, where I used to work at Exeter, the governors insisted that we spent a lot of time. And I was really glad for that, precisely because it meant they were near to, but not over the line of what the business was doing. Um, but I do think it's your findings that really shocked me because um, when they, when I remember you sent me the drafts, Andrew, and when, um, when governors were asked what the major issues were, of universities were, um, uh, facing governance, most of the ones they mentioned were there, but they weren't the really important ones, and that concerned me. Mm. And I think that's because of time that they can spend. So there's some initial comments, Andrew. I hope they're of interest and happy to talk more. Thank you very much. Very, very clear. Jerry, you've heard the perspective of a regulator, of a vice chancellor. You, as an independent council member, what's your response to governance, universities, their future? and the leadership to move us forward. Um, well, thank you very much indeed, Andrew, for the opportunity to join uh, this webinar. Uh, well, Sir Michael and Sir Steve have clearly explained uh, the great importance of the sector and also the many, many challenges facing universities. And what this means, and, and Steve really underlined it, is we need strong and effective university councils and especially the independent members, i.e. the chair and the other, what are often called lay members or non-executives. I prefer to call them independent members and interestingly at Exeter University, they are called independent members because we want to stress the uh, I would say engaged stewardship, which comes from really independent council members. So that's what we need, but what do we have? Well, unfortunately, with uh, 
some very notable exceptions, we have in fact a crisis of governance in the sector. And what is the evidence for this? Well, Henley Business School, under your direction, Andrew, recently carried out original in-depth research into the sector. And their findings were published in, in this book, The Independent Director in Society. I'm just going to select a few of them. And again, Steve made um, this point about time spent. 80% uh, of council members at universities spend less than 20 days a year on this very important, difficult job. And 25% of them spend less than 10 days. 80% um, of the meetings they're engaged in last less than three hours. Over half don't visit faculties and colleges to really understand what is going on and the, and the, and the issues uh, that staff are facing and the attitudes of, of students and so on. Over a quarter are saying that they don't have the data they need to do the job. And 40% say that they don't have really effective relations with stakeholders. <clears throat> now, Steve mentioned the critical importance of stakeholders and the stakeholder complexity issues which universities face. And yet here we have 40% saying that universities by and large, or their university didn't have very effective relations with stakeholders. Some of the other issues which came out of the research were that counts, the university councils are just not diverse enough. We're not just talking here about gender, we're talking about race, age, experience, the whole issue of disability. So here are these very complex challenges and yet the councils do not have really diverse enough membership in order to deal with them. And then the whole issue of to what extent council members are actually appraised and evaluated is something else that is real evidence for concern. These are some of the pieces of evidence from the research which Henley carried out. There are other, there is other evidence and I'm going to quote from the KPMG recent report on stakeholder governance, where they look particularly at um, the ESG agenda, that's the environmental, social and governance agenda, which is certainly becoming more and more of an issue right across society. In fact, of course, there's a major global conference at the moment going on with regard to environment. And what the KPMG research showed was that 80% of universities have an average performance or worse when it comes to stakeholder engagement in this area. Universities, for example, are not required to report on their performance in this area. Whereas if one looks at the world of business in particular, the FTSE 100 and the FRC requires the annual report and the directors of companies to be reporting on this issue. That is not required of universities. Of course, the best universities and an extra, I would say, is one of them do in fact in their annual reports do report on what actually is happening in this area. So uh, the, the job of the independent director of course and especially the chair is not an easy one I would be the first to admit it I've been involved in doing this job for the last 20 years a lot of it in the world of international business and I would say that 
the job in the university is more complex than most jobs of independent directors in business uh, because of all of the challenges and issues which both Sir Michael and Sir Steve have clearly uh, explained. The last thing I really want to touch on, Andrew, is this the issue of the competing interests of different stakeholders. Um, and as a university council member, and I chair the audit committee, uh, this is one of the most difficult issues which I, I find um, one has to deal with. And again, Steve mentioned it, you've got to look at what is in the best long-term interest of the institution. On the other hand, you've got the whole issue of how do you actually balance the books with this very difficult financial model um, that we, we actually have. And then we, we've got the issue of value for money for students. Uh, and how important is that in all of the issues which one is facing? And of course, it's a global international business. And Michael was really focusing on that. So how does how does it how do the independent directors take that into account? So this is a very difficult job to do. And it, it, and so finding the right people, I'm not pretending that's easy to do, but it's extremely important that we seek to engage more and more people in the community to become interest, interested in, in becoming independent directors and chairs in, in universities. There's no, there's no shortage of a, of, of a challenge, that's for sure, as you heard uh, earlier in this webinar. I'm very happy now to take part in any questions. Jerry, thank you very much. Thank you to all th of our three panel members. May I encourage our participants to uh, think about a question, a challenge, if you wish to raise an issue, you can put that in the chat. Please raise your hand. Uh, we have myself and two other people who are looking into, into the chat and to see who's raised their hand. I really do wish to encourage open debate. And whilst we're waiting for our participants to think of the issues, may I ask each one of you, at the sake of repeating yourselves, if I start with Michael, Steve, and then yourself, Jerry, from what you've said, what is that most sensitive governance issue that even stretched you? And it may have been even too sensitive to handle on the day, but if there was one thing that stretched you hard, what was it? Michael. The first thing I want to say actually is not, not to answer that question is, I think the three of us have set out the challenges of being um, on the University Governing Council uh, extremely well, and Steve and Jerry made some really strong points. I just want to also say, it's a fantastically rewarding position to have to be on a governing council, to meet young people striving and imagining and being creative about the future, to see amazing research going on, to see the connection between the university at a practical level and uh, the students of the future in the school system and the economy and so on. So I'd, I wouldn't want anybody to go away from thinking, it is a difficult task as we've all said, but it's also immensely rewarding. Uh, to be involved in institutions that really are pushing the frontiers forward in, in dramatic ways. The most difficult thing I think is, is getting the relationship right between the governing council and the executive team. Uh, it depends above all on the relationship between the chair of the governing council and the chief executive or vice chancellor. Uh, if you get that right, it's then possible to do all the other things because you have to have an honest dialogue. You have to have uh, a governing council that on the whole is supportive of the executive team as far as possible, but is also challenging, demanding, uh, willing uh, and able to make its points uh, visibly. You have to have a, an executive team that is not defensive, that sees the value of good governance and diverse perspectives being brought to bear, but also uh, keeps the strategy, makes its case uh, and builds the relationships with people in the local and regional community uh, that make it possible to lead a great university. So I'd say getting th that nexus, uh, the relationship between the executive and the, 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 the governing council, the independent members, as Jerry called them, I think is fundamentally important. And the chair and the vice chancellor are the key to that. Michael, thank you very much. Steve, what's your response to that? Because that is a theme, <coughs> chairman, CEO in the private sector that has in many ways bedeviled the private sector. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I would say, I would say on the ongoing central challenge was how to have a governing body that was sufficiently engaged, yeah, but not over engaged. And I yeah. think that's and practically that's actually a very, very difficult issue to do. You know, um, you ask people to uh, get involved in universities, meet all these interesting people, f delve deep into the way it works. But then they're governors, they're not um, executives. And I think that's an ongoing issue. But the, I have to say, Andrew, the number one issue that I think was probably the most difficult personally, the, the one that, that, that caused me the most challenge, is, is when you have to talk to governors about, about the removal of key staff. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't mean that that happened often, but governors sometimes want key staff, <laughs> you know, uh, removed. And, and, and you, you have to defend them if you think they're right. Getting that right, and of course, um, that I think the most difficult issue for a vice chancellor is when it comes to the removal of a vice chancellor. And uh, Michael's got much more experience uh, than I have on this, but I suspect that goes back to the first point, Andrew, because paradoxically, you can have a chair that's too close to a vice chancellor. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a, there's a, I think, you know, that's the, probably the most difficult issue for, for, for the sector, but it really is. There's an XVC. It was the personnel issues that worried me the most. Yeah. Thank you. And as the independent member, Jerry? Well, I, the most critical issue that I can recollect really is around the long term versus the short term issue facing uh, university uh, just before the when the pandemic was breaking, for example, uh, we had so much uncertainty about what was going to be happening to the financial situation with universities. We didn't know whether we were going to have any international students at all, for example, looking ahead for a year or two. We just didn't know so much um, because of the pandemic and what was happening. So one had to kind of balance that short term concern that we should have, a, we should at the end of the day be financially strong enough and I'm chair I chair the audit committee with a I would say a particular responsibility for that on the other hand of course the university has to continue to invest for its long-term sustainability and that to me was really we were being asked to make difficult decisions at that time about what was in the best long-term interest of the institution on the other hand when, when we're thinking, well, well, are we going to be here tomorrow? Are we going to be financially strong enough? So even a university like, like Exeter, which, I mean, we just had our external audit, and now we've, <laughs> we're in a very strong financial position. And I think it was because we were very careful during that period of time. We reduced our capital spend right down, for example, uh, so that we would, we knew, therefore, that we were going to be financially um, strong and able to withstand um, what, whatever came to us during the pandemic. But I, I, that, I think, was probably one of the most difficult that um, I've had to deal with at the university. Thank you. We have some very interesting comments and questions in the chat and in the Q&A, and I'll take them in order as they come. David Trenchard, I'll read out for the panel members. Uh, given the inexorable growth in Chinese student numbers, especially in this country, how do the panelists view the challenges that this may pose? And what are the governance needs which are necessary to manage what may sometimes be conflicting needs? Michael, can I start with you? Uh, yes, although I think Steve um, is, is probably best informed on this question. I, my, my advice to any uh, vice chancellor or governing council of a university on this is to make sure that as you increasingly recruit international students which is potentially good for the students potentially good for britain in general you don't over depend on any single country uh, you, you have diverse uh, diverse range of students from a diverse range of backgrounds over dependence on any single country is like a business that uh, just uh, you know has depends on a single product or a single market for for its profits and then something changes in those circumstances um 
the Australian universities have suffered enormously from over-dependence on Chinese students. So I think it's good for Chinese students to come to Britain, but I'd advise any university not to over-depend on any single supplier. And whether it's Chinese or any other uh, supplying country of, uh, of students and talent, it's also very, very important, going back to one of my points earlier on, to continue to promote the values that underpin universities in Britain, the values of democracy, freedom of speech, and so on. So wherever you're getting your students from, the, one of the reasons British universities are successful is because they do promote free speech. They are democratic institutions. They are places where diversity of thought is encouraged. So that's, that's really, really important because that's, that's the essence of being a university. But equally, don't depend on any single source of supply of international students. Thank you very much. Uh, the reason I didn't put it to Steve is because we have Murray Steele, who's posed a particular question for you, Steve. Let me read it out. So Steve speaks as though there is nothing that can be done about the profitability of various activities. Why don't we use costs and increase productivity as business would do? Steve? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so it's a deep question. And, and you, I mean, of course, it's the, it's the obvious, I mean, Business people that have come onto the governing body I've worked on have raised that pretty much at every single meeting. Um, and, and it goes back, Murray, to, to, to the complexity point. Research, let me just take research. So at the University of Exeter, roughly speaking, about 107 million of research grants a year. Now they're funded not at 100%, they're funded at 80% maximum. That's, that's the structure of the, of the funding regime. And we're meant to get money in um, from other sources. So the paradox, and, and, and Jerry will remember this well, is you go to the governors and you say, well, what we want you to do is to grow the research base. But to grow the research base, you have to take more international students in order to provide the income to fill the 20% gap. So being more productive um, in research is a really weird thing because it's not simply save a bit of money. It's the fact that if you save it, it's funded at less. It's because it's based on the on the cost you incur. On other things, uh, uh, Murray, the the if you look at the numbers, staff student ratios have been increasing enormously. There's a lot of criticism in the sector about the use of casualized uh, short term staff. Um, I think the sector actually on any productivity uh, measure in international comparison does extremely well. There's a wonderful piece of work done by Universitas 21, which basically says the UK is nowhere near the top in terms of the level of funding, but it's first or second in outputs. That's a comparative business study of, of the efficiency of the sector. So I honestly think it is pretty effective, but Murray, you know, at the moment we're trying to reform as a sector the, the, the pension system. And that leads you to another problem that, that you then, you your stakeholders take very different views on these things. Um, so solving one problem isn't always easy um, because you've got other pressures that, that might be adversely affected by that change. I'd say the sector is very efficient. I'd say the research base in particular is incredibly efficient, the most efficient system in the world. But there's a fundamental structural issue about the funding of the system that I think does cause uh, problems for, for making the kind of savings you're talking about. Steve, I know Murray didn't ask this, but it may be at the back of his mind. When you've made such comments to your own council members, especially the ones from a business background, what has been their response, really? Um, I think scepticism. I don't think, I mean, you know, Jerry can answer. I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of learning. I mean, I do think the particular structure of the research base in the UK is really difficult to get around because you'd think, the more research you do, the, the more high quality it is, the more funding you get. It's that fundamental view um, that research loses money that is genuinely difficult. And I can remember many me council meetings when we've talked about increasing research and then saying, yes, and what we have to do to find the funding to make up the missing element is to, to raise the number of international students. And that is difficult, Andrew. I understand that. Jerry, we have a question from Marta Phillips, and I think it's very much in your area. Let me read out the question to you. Given the financial risk that almost all universities, tens if not hundreds of millions of pounds each year, 
the aspirations for greater diversity and other challenges, does it still make sense to continue to rely on noblesse oblige to find independent governors of the right caliber to deliver what is needed for universities? Now, as an independent governor, Jerry, your response. Uh, my response is no, it doesn't really make sense to rely upon um, volunteers to, um, to be independent council members. Um, we raised this issue um, that came out of the research because it was very interesting. We did ask that question. Uh, and there were, there's a diversity of opinion, of course, and that was reflected in the results of the research where people were saying, well, if you're not careful, people will do this job just for the money. And we don't want that. Um, so therefore, let's continue with the present system. My answer to that is this, that the big issue we have is diversity. And how does one really get the diversity that you need on university councils if we're going to rely upon the fact that people um, are not paid to do this? Because that immediately rules out people who can't afford to do it, even though they might be intellectually qualified to do it, even though they might have all the right experience to do it. But if they've got a family to raise, for example, or they might be in their thirties or making a career and they can't afford, therefore, to do this job, especially since it's to do it properly, you need to spend you know, the appropriate amount of time doing it. Let's think about being a chair, for example. I mean, the chair at Exeter, who's a marvellous chair, Sarah, spends, we think, 90 days a year. 90 days a year now, and she's not paid to do that. Um, <coughs> so I don't think it does make any sense, <laughs> excuse me, to continue to rely upon volunteers to do a very, very important job. We need to get more diversity on our boards, and to do that, we need to remove this economic hindrance. Thank you very much, Jerry, which leads on to a further question from Nicola DeLong. I'll read it out. Most institutions in England don't pay governors. Is this model sustainable with the increasing demands in particular, given the challenge around time needed to govern and the need to increase diversity? Uh, Michael, do you have anything different or something uh, to say in response to Nicola's question, which follows on from Jerry's comments? Um, I think... Well, it is a very challenging job. It is quite a time consuming job if you're going to do it well. I, I've been on um, in, in the past 20 years on the, the governing councils of three different institutions. Um, and you come to governing council meetings, you want to have, obviously to have read the paper, you want to be able to contribute. Um, and I, I, I'll give a, um, a not helpful answer, but I, I'm not quite sure about this payment question. I think Jerry has just made a very good case for it. Um, and if you want diversity, as somebody's saying in the chat, uh, and you want to encourage uh, younger people and people from more diverse backgrounds, there may well be a strong case for, for payment of governing council members in certain circumstances. And it may be that we have to look at that, um, a variety of different circumstances of who the people are rather than a blanket pay policy. I don't know. I'd like to give it some thought. Thank you. Steve, your perspective as Vice-Chancellor? <laughs> Well, I, 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 it's come up a lot in the, in the chat, and I think Karen Cox, you know, a vice chancellor herself, um, makes the point. I mean, it, I think it is ultimately linked to diversity. I think there is a real issue here. Um, I mean, I've been on many, you know, bodies where uh, are trying to improve diversity. Um, if you're trying to uh, appoint people from different backgrounds, certainly. Uh, if you're trying to appoint people in, in early to mid part of career, it's really difficult to say to them, well, actually, we'd like you to give up 20, 30, 40 days a year um, at exactly the time in which they may be trying to, you know, balance uh, family life with, uh, you know, parental responsibilities or caring responsibilities. So I've never been in favour of paying governors, except I now realise if you don't pay governors, you end up with people 
who are, you know, of a certain age, of a certain, uh, and therefore uh, tends to be from a certain background. And I know we struggled, uh, and, and the governors at Exeter spent a lot of time on, on skills matrix, on, on diversity. We, we monitored all these things, um, and it was a job to get people to improve that diversity. So reluctantly, in one sense, um, I think payment might be a way uh, around this, uh, but it is... I, I, to be honest, Andrew, I think no one wants to go first on that. I understand that. Steve, can I stay with you? Because we have a question from Michael Queen, which follows on from your response. Let me read it out. Do the panel think paying independent members would attract a more diverse range of people and reset their expectations on the time commitment required? Or would it damage the ethos of the current council model? And it was that last bit I wanted your comments on, or would it damage the ethos of the current council model? That's well, that's a great point. Um, I mean, there's a danger it would. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I now sit on a board uh, in, the, in the private sector, which is remunerated. And that's got a fantastic ethos. Um, what the payment does, I think, is allow the, the board to to explicitly balance its skill set without money being a barrier. And I think that's where governors will will want to uh, uh, have that discussion about, about payment, because I, I do think the need to make the governing body reflective of the student and staff body or the body of the community in which the university uh, exists is a very, very powerful argument. Um, Ultimately, the culture comes from the way the body's chaired, it seems to me, and that crucial point of the relationship between the chair of governors and the chief of deck. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to David Dupont. And David asks, given the ex expected financial pressures over the coming years, how should governors prepare for what could be significant restructuring in the sector? Can I take you, Jerry, first and Steve second? Yeah, by all means, uh, I, um, and Steve will remember this, I'm quite, <laughs> council meetings, I would ask him this question about the university sector and what would happen if and when institutions got into financial trouble and what did he expect to happen? And he replied, well, and he said it today, there's going to be greater uh, divergence within the sector is happening for sure and what we're going to face is and this is an issue which Michael want to, may want to comment this is a real issue for the regulator what happens when you get universities who, who cannot continue to survive financially it's already happened in the FE sector and in the FE sector colleges have been persuaded to work together uh, and, and, and to combine and in that way uh, deal with the problem. All I can say is that I think that in the, what we really need there from councils are independent council members who really understand all the issues associated with restructuring of businesses. Because at the end of the day, university is a business. You know, actually the university has a turnover of 450 million. So that's my answer. Thank you, Steve. Any comment? To yeah, that? I think I think David's put his finger on a really important point. And the answer is actually it's about the process of making sure, you know, I, I, I do think, Andrew, I mean, you know, you've come across this in many other organizations. Um, the really important point I had, a, I had a vice chancellor uh, contact me recently to say that the, 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 the governors were surprised that there was a financial problem. <laughs> now it'd been in the numbers but but were the governors really you know looking at the numbers deeply did they have the skill set to look at the numbers deeply um i mean i think governors really have to ensure that they're not just looking at upsides and optimistic forecasts what's the history of accuracy of forecasts what are the projections um, so David's point is absolutely key and i think the number one requirement is to make sure that they have access not just to the data, but David, I would say, <clears throat> to have access to triangulated data. In other yeah. words, that they have an ability to form an independent judgment on the data they're getting by having access to other sources, 
Committee of University Chairs, for example, which has a lot of data and um, which could be very, very useful. Do they do they get access to research uh, fortnight to times higher to the major newspaper articles on it, the FT, you know, that give you the data <clears throat> on financial performance? And, and I'd say, David, the final thing is I, if I was a governor, the one thing I wouldn't do is simply rely on what I was told by the management, because my job as an independent uh, governor is to make sure that I come to an independent view of the information that I'm being, uh, what I'm being told, so I can make a, a considered judgment. Thank you very much. Karen Cox, I hope you find that answer sufficient, the, the role and importance of the chair in answering your question. We have one minute to go. I have one final question. Uh, it comes from Murray Steele again. Uh, it's a bit of a critical question, but just a quick response. This is like listening to a group of politicians long on analysis of the problem and the many obstacles to change and short on any practical suggestions for improvements. Um, Steve, I can start with you, then Michael, then Jerry. Just a quick comment on that. You may not even agree with that. Well, I don't agree with it. I think the sector, just look at the data. You know, um, I understand where Murray's coming from. I know, uh, you know, I know about Murray. I know his work. Um, the point is, I know, no, no, he's a very distinguished individual, but the point is, look at how the UK's performed, look at the international comparisons, go to the data, the UK sector has done extraordinary well, it's one of the great world class strengths of the UK, and all I can say is I suspect if you ask people who were at Exeter 20 years ago and Exeter now, um, I do think there's been a fair bit of change. Thank you. Jerry. Well, again, I know Murray. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> read our book, Murray, because in our book we're putting forward all kinds of very positive proposals as to how to deal with the issues of governance which clearly the universities face. But put simply, I would say increased diversity, very important indeed. I would pay independent members of council. And, and thirdly, I would make sure they're properly appraised so that they have to do a very good job and then fourthly evaluate the, the council every year independently they're the four things which i would say we should be doing thank you thank you very much and final comment from michael are you still there michael's left us a couple of minutes ago i'm afraid andrew he had another commitment at 10 o'clock so lovely well, may I say thank you to our panel members for their insights, for the time they've given and for the thoughtful comment made, which has led to a very interesting discussion. Thank you especially to our participants and for the questions you've asked. Chris, for those participants whose questions have not been answered, can we circulate them to our panel members, perhaps for a quick response? Yeah, we'll do that, Andrew. We will. That would be fantastic. Thank you to everybody. I hope you found the session interesting. Thank you, Michael, Steve and Jerry, and thank you all. It's been a very interesting morning. And I'd like to thank, by the way, the IOD for arranging this. Thank you all. It's been our pleasure, Andrew. Just to let everybody know that we will be, uh, we have been recording this session and we'll make a copy of the recording available if you, if you want to view it again or if you want to share it with colleagues and contacts. That will hopefully be up on the IOD Centre's website and social media accounts in the next couple of days. Thank you every, again. Um, as Andrew says, we'll do our best to answer the other questions for you um, after the event. Some homework for Steve and, uh, and Jerry. Uh, but thank you to, to Andrew, to all of our panel, and thank you for joining us this morning, everybody.